I've seen lots of clients and I've seen even, you know, people that have worked on a team become paralyzed with all of these data points. Sometimes they're pointing you in a really clear direction, but to be honest, a lot of times it's sort of narrowing your field, but it's not really telling you exactly which way to go. And that's kind of where you have to take some level of intuition and a leap of faith on what to focus on to kind of get to the next level. Welcome to the Strategic Momentum Podcast, the show where we share tips, stories, and advice from progressive leaders on what it takes to break through that business inertia and propel you and your business forward. I'm your host, Connie Steele. In business today, being data-driven can be a major factor in whether you and the company you work for succeeds or fails. The wealth of information that's now available is helping us make decisions big and small, strategic and tactical. Yet we didn't have all this data in the past, and people were still making good decisions every day. And without a world full of data, people were just relying more on their gut, their instincts. Given the shift towards data and analytics and decision-making, I personally wanted to understand is one style of decision making now more effective than the other? Because there can be conflicts between those data driven decision makers and those that go by their gut. To help me answer this question, I talked to a number of experts across different fields to get their take. Dr. Lamia, a psychologist who has spent her career studying and encouraging emotional awareness. Dr. Lamia has joined us twice before on the show, back in episodes 9 and 12, to discuss emotions and motivation. Jen McDonald, the Executive Director of Client Engagement at Global Marketing Agency, VML YNR. As a 20-year marketing veteran, she's worked across a variety of industries and has been at the forefront of the digital and data revolution. Kyle Laudermilk, the President and CEO of GSE Systems, which provides professional and technical engineering, staffing services, and simulation software to clients in the power and process industries. Steve Brown, a Director at Salesforce, that's inspiring growth of Salesforce Einstein by leading a team of talented specialists committed to driving customer success. And finally, Dana Cavalia, our guest in episode 24, and the former Director of Strength and Conditioning and Performance Enhancement with the New York Yankees organization. Dana helped pioneer data-driven performance optimization in baseball. And now Dana brings those same performance optimization techniques to business leaders, entrepreneurs, and pro athletes all around the world. And with this history, you might expect Dana to be a big proponent of data to drive decisions and actions, but it's actually something he said to the contrary that really got me thinking about this topic. We know we're in such a data era across the board, business, sports, sports are really big business anyway. But when I first started with the team, you had this group of people, which was the majority, that was going off of gut. You know, how's this player? Oh, he's good. He looks good. And then you had this very small group, which was probably maybe me and another team or two, that said, hey, I think we can get some more metrics on on these players. So what I did was I created a personal player performance evaluation and assessment. So at the start of spring training every year, I would break down each player. I'd break down their physicality. I'd break down parts of their mentality. And what I would do is I'd cross-reference that in an interview with, hey, what are your pain patterns day to day? What's your injury history over the past five years? And on top of all that, how are you feeling? You know, so I, I never wanted to lose the individual on the team. And by doing that, I was able to connect at a very deep level with the player right off the bat. And I was also able to show the GM how we could be innovative and how we could be one of the first teams to use data to drive results and drive performance. And if a player gets hurt, how do we know he's ready again? Well, we go and we go to their pre-injury data. And if they can be within 10% of those numbers, then they're ready to go. And, and again, it was, it was very primal data at the time. Now a lot of teams are creating like sports science departments and now <laughs> they're going to the extreme because they're losing the players are becoming numbers and stats and data and they're forgetting that these are people that may have a fight with their wife. They may have a child on the way. They may be a new parent. They may be struggling and having to balance those other variables. They may have some financial distress. We don't know, but 
one thing we do know is when we focus too much on the numbers, we lose the gut. We lose our, our, you know, our human instincts because we're over analyzing numbers. And we all know we could fudge data to say whatever we want if we want to. Our friend Dr. Lamia echoed Dana's sentiments, discussing how she sees an increasing reliance on data in every area of life. Being data-driven is not just in business these days. It's also in the field of psychology. If you think about it, uh, a lot of insurance companies are only paying for treatments that have some kind of empirical foundation. You have to prove that they work. It's all data-driven, and that data gets skewed. Data is skewed often when someone is trying to prove a point or prove something works. So can we really rely on data? Or how about where somebody cannot explain exactly based on some data how they arrive at a particular conclusion or how they do their work? Going back to baseball for a moment, Kyle Laudermilk offers a great perspective on the dangers of data reliance and how it's fundamentally changed the way baseball is played and how a similar trend in business may impact the opportunity for gut-based disruption. I'm a baseball fan, and obviously baseball in the 70s, 80s, and through the 90s, early 2000s, uh, mostly gut-driven, you know, um, picking players and setting lineups, etc. And now it's all cybermetrics, which is really data and data analytics. What that has led to is such a a predictable style of play that, you know, there's speculation that if there is a more versatile player that can, you know, for instance, not only uh, hit home runs to the right field, but can lay down a bunt if there's a shift on or or hit a single down uh, the left field line, that's going to upend uh, much of what now is an infrastructure in baseball. And I, I do wonder, and you know, don't have any firm opinion, will that apply to other industries that get so set in routinized data analytics? Uh, will there be an opportunity for gut to create a differentiation in companies? So based on these two perspectives, you might be thinking that being too heavily data focused isn't ideal. However, I hope you're not getting the wrong idea. This isn't a hit piece on data. Relying too much on your gut isn't any good either. But I'm going to let Steve Brown tell you about that. Where I am within Salesforce, I run a team that's focused on analytics, data science, machine learning. So I am talking to customers about this all the time. There is an important aspect that we talk about with AI and machine learning, which is removing bias, right? So overly relying on gut is also overly relying on your own biases that you bring to the table. And so there is an aspect where these are, it's a bit yin and yang. One can check the other, right? So over-reliance on, on gut, you're, you're bringing your own uh, biases, your own preconceived notions to the table. And over-reliance on data, you're missing out on the, the potentially the human aspect or the part that only, the patterns that only a human can tease out. You may already be noticing that neither style of decision-making seems to be better than the other, because in fact, you need a balance of both. As Dana, Dr. Lamia, and Steve explained, leaning too hard in either direction can really lead you astray. And I love the way that Jen McDonald embodies this balance in her work, as she'll share that you can be paralyzed by the amount of data available. All that data doesn't necessarily help lead you to a clear conclusion. And I think you'll understand why after you hear the story about Wendy's. I feel like in our profession, people in marketing, you can really become a total slave to data that's not necessarily meaningful. But when you're talking about marketing and working with consumers to help change their behavior, I mean, certainly you need data to make some level of information. You need to know who a consumer is, what drives them, but you also need some level of of intuition because there's not like a exact formula that's going to tell you how you're going to get someone to, um, let's say, go to Wendy's instead of McDonald's or to pick a 
certain brand of paint off the shelf. So you have to have some data, but at the same time, when you're making creative decisions, what does that have to do with intuition? And I think it's been effective to sort of blend all of them, um, blend those kind of styles together. In in the end, for what I do working at a uh, marketing agency, to be honest, there's like so much more data available. And in some ways, we're kind of drowning in it. And it's a little bit unclear on kind of what to pay attention to. So for example, I mean, you have um, tools that help you get all kinds of you know, real-time information about how things are doing, uh, how an ad campaign might be doing on social media or what consumers are are saying on, on Twitter. And then there's information from, you know, Google about how people are interacting with a um, website or your apps. And, you know, I think the key... And then there's kind of your traditional research and, and data that you might be getting from surveys and focus groups and those types of things. And I think the key um, is you can, I've, I've seen lots of clients and I've seen even, um, you know, people that have worked on a team become paralyzed with all of these data points. Sometimes they're pointing you in a really clear direction, but to be honest, a lot of times it's sort of narrowing your field, but it's not really telling you exactly which way to go. And that's kind of where you have to take some level of intuition and a leap of faith on what to focus on to kind of get to the next level. And I'll give you kind of a real world example. So one of our clients is is Wendy's and they have obviously their I mean their their business is uncomplicated on some degree, you know, selling um, burgers and fries and and a lot of times limited time offers and they were um, really kind of thinking, what do we focus on for um, the coming year in terms of messages? And they could go in a, a million different directions. They could talk about new flavors. They could talk about customizing your burger. You could talk about lots of different things. And so we were pulling through various pieces of data and research, and we kind of came across something really interesting that said, well, when consumers know that the hamburgers are fresh, made from fresh, never frozen beef, they're more likely to choose to go to uh, Wendy's. And so we kind of asked the question, like, how many consumers are, are you tracking this? Like how many consumers actually believe that your, your beef is fresh? And they're like, yeah, we track it. And actually, interestingly, it had gone down, down, down over the years. It was probably hovering it around uh, 20% of consumers. Then we start going to focus groups and seeing how uh, people were questioning, even if we'd say it in a commercial, fresh, never frozen beef, people were like, well, that's not true. How could they do that? That's not true. And suddenly it was kind of a light bulb went off. And this is where the gut comes in that it's like, we've been saying these words, fresh, never frozen, but we're not making an impact on making consumers believe that our beef is fresh. And so we said, okay, we need to actually make a extremely, you know, focused and concerted effort to move just that one metric, that one number. And it was kind of hard for Wendy's to get behind because they were like, well, we've been saying that for a long time. And we're like, but you haven't been saying it in a really focused way. And so now, you know, two years later, that number that was hovering around 20% is like, you know, approaching 60% of the U.S. and they've grown hamburger share for the first time in 10 years. And there's a lot of great things that have happened through that. But I guess that's a good example of like data really sort of pointing you in the right direction, but it can definitely often be buried among a lot of things. Sometimes it's it's about kind of focusing on maybe even one data point that you want to move and then kind of using your, a little bit of intuition and gut on how to, how to make that happen. By working at Salesforce, you might expect Steve Brown to be highly data-driven, but he actually heavily leans towards the gut side of the equation. And that has been a result of his past work experience in startups. As you and I have talked before, I've uh, been in the startup world, right, previously in my career. And I think the nature of that world is you need to make decisions with your gut. You're moving so fast. 
you wear so many hats, you just need to get in, make the decision and move on. And I found the decision making part of it was a little bit uh, governed by hindsight bias, like things that we already knew that were working, we would then look for the data to say, yep, look at that great decision we made, right. But at the time, you know, I think it was a lot of collective gut-based decision-making. That's why I think startup founders, they talk a lot about that uh, that startup chemistry, the leadership team, right? How well they work together because their, their instincts, you know, kind of have to be working in sync. However, in trying to understand his own decision-making process better, he's learning when and where to incorporate balance. This is actually a topic that's very timely for me because I have been reading a book. I'm right in the middle of it. Uh, It's called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. So in there, he talks about, it's a pretty simple premise, system one and system two thinking, where system one is your gut and you make the decision really quickly. And then system two is that, you know, part of the brain that kicks in and looks for the background data and justification for making that process and decision. And it was recommended by the the head of sales here at Salesforce as a, as a great, you know, sort of changing book. And it's, I have found it very fascinating and I am studying my own sort of system one tendencies and building my system two muscle over time to be a little bit more, yeah, data driven in my decision making. Like I've gone through these different uh, ways to understand how I make decisions, what leadership styles I have so that I can be effective with those that I lead. And I don't know that gut is more effective as a blanket statement, but it works well for me. And then I find that I look for the data to back up that decision. (laughs) And like I say, it has been, I think, evolving over time but still predominantly gut at this point. How that has evolved over time is for the past uh, several years, I've been here at Salesforce, obviously a much bigger company. When I joined, we were about 17,000 people. Now we're close to 40,000 people. And in that context, you just need to bring data to the table when you're making decisions. You need to be able to justify your decisions to others. And you need to be able to communicate to those that you lead also why you're making certain decisions. So I think my decision-making process is evolving to one where it is data-driven at, let's say, the process level in terms of what decisions we need to make to, you know, pursue this line of business, to do this with the product. But at the individual level, still very much gut. Uh, it's still very much a high EQ environment with leading people and making decisions based on reading people. And that's kind of tough to quantify sometimes, though the data might bring the conversation to the table. It's that gut-based decision level at a, at a fundamental leadership level is where I find myself today. In large companies like Salesforce, it's important to justify decisions with data. Contrast that with smaller companies and startups, the dynamic seems quite the opposite. And one could argue that your more dominant decision-making mode doesn't just vary based on the situational context, but also depending on what career stage you might be in. For example, Steve shares a story of an employee who was early in his career, and that employee applied a very convincing data-driven approach to reflect his performance. I'll never forget I had a employee early on in my career. And it was time for an annual review back when we were doing annual reviews. And and this was a small company. I knew him quite well. He brought data about when it came time to talk salary, he knew the average salary for folks in his range. He knew he, he brought so much data to the table, including that of his own performance. It was so compelling, uh, the case that he made for himself. And that really stuck with me, uh, how the, that data-driven approach, it was hard to argue with. And so I think that was very effective for him uh, early, in, early in his career. And he has since gone on to found a company and be CEO himself. So uh, it was effective for <laughs> an effective style for his career. 
Yet Kyle, who began his career as an engineer, interestingly enough, started out being more gut-driven. I'd say even though I was an engineer uh, um, by education earlier in my career, while performing engineering duties, and that those are very you know data-driven and, and especially in strategic modeling, which is a form of analysis. I would say when it came to you know many decisions, whether it be professional or personal, uh, were mostly driven by gut um, at that point. But I will say, you know, uh, being quite so young now. Um, Building uh, more life experience uh, provides more perspectives. So I think that has allowed at least me to have uh, better insight uh, to be gained uh, through analyzing data so that to the extent that there's a gut, at least it's an informed gut decision based on some type of analytics and, and facts. As Kyle alludes to, with maturity and experience comes perspective, which you don't always get when you're younger. Even as the most data-driven guest in this episode... Kyle understands that he can't solely rely on data to make his decisions. So I would say I, I definitely lean towards the data side versus gut, but you can't have one without the other, particularly, you know, given a background of an engineer by formal education and in, in technology and work for, you know, a business intelligence company. So uh, a love of data, but more importantly, a love of analysis of the data and uh, seeing what insights can um uh, be derived from that. That that's that's my heavy lean, but I, I will say there's always a gut check of applied uh, as an overlay to that of you know before pulling the trigger and getting buy-in with other people. The gut check around is this something we really want to do? Are there some qualitative things um, that we need to consider? Uh, can we stack rank those qualitative considerations? Is this something we are comfortable doing despite all the data, which may say it looks great? any soft criteria that we uh, may be ignoring because of the data and uh, or overlooking or downplaying. And so data in and of itself isn't so valuable, but the analysis of the data is where either make or break good decisions. And having a broader perspective, say, today than I did when I was in college, both professionally and personally, that, that helps the process of analytics, at least in, in I feel for, for what I'm doing here to, to make better informed decisions. Kyle and Steve also both emphasize the interesting point that ultimately how we balance our gut versus the data can and does change by context. When we are in different places in our life, when we have more perspective, when we fill a different role personally or professionally, we can't just continue using the same decision-making methodology we've always used. New challenges require developing new skills and strategies, like moving from being functionally specific to moving towards a more general management role like Kyle. But I'll let him tell you more about that. In my role today, I have to be a Swiss Army knife. I have to have the ability to understand finance, but not be the expert in finance. I have to be, you know, aware of what it's what it's like to work with the street and investor relations, but not be the IR expert. Uh, I have to understand corp dev and strategy really is around my neck. We're responsible as a team, but those are my primary uh, objectives. I have to be aware of technology, but not the technologist and the expert in technology anymore. So earlier in my career, one tool out of that Swiss Army knife, or maybe two at a time, would be applied very heavily. So early on in my career, I was based overseas as an engineer, very heavy into certain skills. Uh, first, obviously, the technology that we were using uh, as part of the project, how to be an expert in that and developing that, and also working with um, stakeholders to understand um, what is a work product they require as part of this uh, investment that we made in IT infrastructure uh, over a series of years there. And so different roles required different tools, you know, some of which I had to develop. They weren't there, but I had to, you know, figure it out. To make things more interesting, we're going to add a new wrinkle into this whole gut versus data dynamic. What if I told you that your gut actually is data? Or more accurately, what if I let Dr. Lamia tell you? And what I realized is that many people who trust their gut don't understand where that comes from. You know, don't they don't know the language of their intuition and why that happens the way it does. 
And so that's one of the reasons why they do or don't trust it. I mean, how can you trust something when you don't know the language it's speaking to you, but you know it's saying something that you want to listen to? There we get to the heart of what is a gut decision. We ignore the fact that gut decisions have more data than anything we could put on paper. Because when we make a gut decision, people aren't aware that memory is an important contributor to our emotional responses to situations. We appraise every single event or a decision we're making consciously and unconsciously. And it's often based on how closely the situation resembles things that we've been through in the past. But when we're in a present circumstance or situation, our emotional memory gets scanned. Our entire warehouse of memories where the present situation matches a past situation gets scanned and informs our emotional response. So in terms of data-driven, how much more data do you want than your entire warehouse of emotional memories? That gives us what we feel. And so then you evaluate what you feel based on uh, based on your present circumstance as well and, and your cognitive assessment of it. So there's a lot of different kinds of data, isn't it? Tell me more when you talked about, you know, helping to define the language of gut. I know you talked a little bit about that. It's sort of scanning that memory bank and that you have, but I'd love for you to elaborate more on, on what you mean. Sure. You know, our brain has the ability to evaluate situations. I mean, some people refer to it as an appraisal tendency that we have. And that is when automatically, when we're making a decision or if there's a stimulus in our environment, like a decision we have to make, our emotional system takes into account our well-being and our plans and our goals when it evaluates events or situations and gives them meaning. So the brain scans the incoming sensory information and takes a look at how it matches past situations. And that's how it comes up with an emotional response. And then we feel that sensation and cognitively take a look at it and decide whether or not we're going to trust it or decide, take a look at what it might mean for us and why we are responding that way emotionally. So it's a matter of people learning how to use their emotions and their cognitions together. And memory is just such an important part of that. You have to trust your memory because we've lived a lot of years and we've had a lot of situations in our lives. And our memory bank is filled with information. And that's what gives us our gut decisions. And, you know, it's sort of a qualitative assessment rather than a quantitative assessment of the situation. Uh, the qualitative aspect of it uh, has to do with all the emotional experiences you've had that are similar to the present one. And so your your brain does this automatically for you, and it scans all of them, and, and it comes up with some conclusion about how you feel. And so... Is qualitative data as significant as quantitative data? Well, I think we're coming to find, if we look at a lot of the qualitative analyses people do, that in some ways it's deeper because it's it's not just cognitive, it's not just numbers, it's lived experience of situations. And so if you've had thousands of lived experiences of, of situations that are in your emotional memory and you have one at present and your brain scans all of those, it comes to some conclusion based on that qualitative data. I would have never looked at it this way, thinking of gut as qualitative and the data as quantitative. But with that understanding in the language of gut that Dr. Lamia provided, it offers perspective around the dynamic between gut and data and how we can strategically use a balance of both. Having worked in market research and having an appreciation for the craft, I've always used qualitative and quantitative learning because quant is an effective way to validate something. But the qual is really important to provide the context of the why and give you the emotional aspect. With this new context on the subject, I had to know, 
does Dr. Lumia believe one decision-making style is more effective than the other? Because in this day and age, many of us feel that we should be more data-driven. And on top of that, we just got a new source of emotional data to sift through. I think this should is big in what you say, because it's, it should as though we give, we give some primacy to anything that's cognitive or anything that is a number or, or data, when in fact, research has shown, I mean, if you look at uh, McGilchrist books, he talks about how really it's our emotional system that's far more powerful than our cognitive one in, in these kinds of situations. But we give primacy to cognition because we don't trust our gut. And we don't trust our gut because we don't understand its language. And so if, if people understand it better, I think perhaps they will lean on it a bit more or use both. I mean, our motivational system is made up of cognition and emotion. And so using both is really ideal because we could evaluate what we feel and then come to some conclusion. I mean, we can cognitively evaluate it and that's important to do. I started this episode by asking what decision-making style is more effective, data-driven or gut-driven? And based on all these great perspectives, it really seems that neither is better. You have to balance both. As Dr. Lamia points out, we often dismiss our gut because it's just a feeling. But your intuition isn't random. It's actually pulling from memories and experiences, data sets that you may not consciously realize you have. And I think having this understanding makes your gut decisions easier to contextualize and consider. But it's your head and your heart working together that will ultimately help you arrive at the most sound decision because you will have this blend of quantitative analysis, the actual numbers and data points provided around a problem, and qualitative analysis, the memories and experiences that allow you to add context to the greater why. This whole idea came up after seeing trends in technology contributing to the perception that data is king. But in reality, trends in technology are some of the biggest reasons we can't be one-dimensional in our decision-making. Things like artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence are becoming a very real part of our work and personal lives. And as a result, we have to be able to quickly adapt to rapid change, learning to take a multi-dimensional approach to problems and use all the tools in our Swiss army knife, just like Kyle did. Relying only on numbers can bog you down and you'll have a lot of numbers to use. So learning how to interpret your gut reaction to data will help you make the kind of rapid decisions that will be required in the near future of work. The reality is that very few of us work alone. So our decision-making style isn't the only one thing that matters. All the people you work with, in particular your boss or bosses, have their own decision-making styles too. And if those styles are contrary to yours, you may end up creating conflict. So in the next episode, our guests will return and provide their perspective on how to navigate decision-making conflicts at work so that we can start making the best decisions together or at the very least, avoid unnecessary conflict. And before we leave, I'd like to thank each of our guests for sharing their wide breadth of perspectives and experiences. Dana Cavalia can be found at danacavalia.com. That's D-A-N-A-C-A-V-A-L-E-A.com. Dr. Lamia's online home is marylamia.com. That's M-A-R-Y-L-A-M-I-A.com. You can learn more about Kyle Loudermilk at GSC Systems at gses.com. You can connect with Steve Brown by searching his name on LinkedIn. And you can connect with Jen McDonald by finding her on LinkedIn as well. You can also find the links for all of our guests in the show notes for this episode. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. This is what helps others find the podcast. You can also find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher Radio. And if you want to hear previous episodes or get show notes from this episode, you can also visit us at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.